Okay, thank you, Sean, for joining us. Um, we really look forward to this conversation today. Um, Sean Ramirez is the head of data science at Shelf Engine um, and has a really interesting sense of background in academia as well as other uh, professional pursuits. Um, just to sort of do a bit of framing, um, you know, I understand that you've done end-to-end -end research on terrorism and strategic negotiations. Uh, you're an expert on advanced statistical modeling, NLP, field experiments, economic models of strategic behavior, otherwise known as game theory. Uh, you've given talks and published uh, on topics such as how AI will affect business in the next decade, uh, promises and perils of AI. Uh, but I want to talk to you about groceries, if, if we could do that. Uh, absolutely, today. absolutely. Um, yep. But uh, in, in all seriousness, um, I think it would be great to, to get a bit of your background, um, sort of how you started off in, in this industry uh, and what sort of led you to where you are today. Sure. Yeah, I uh, was a previously, as you mentioned, like a professor of political science. I studied quantitative social behavior, especially complex systems of social behavior in high stakes situations. Terrorism is, I think, a pretty high stakes situation. Uh, lots of lives on the line, lots of things going on and lots of questions we have about who the right actors are, what they're doing, why they're doing it, and then how our policies affect those, those kinds of behaviors and incidents around the world. So it was really fun. I left that though, because I wasn't having very much impact on terrorism in the world or the kind of impact I wanted. Um, for, the, for the tech industry, tech industry has so many opportunities to have such high impact and really affect people's lives. And so that's been a real uh, driving motivator for me. I did some, I worked at a boot camp and trained data scientists and engineers on many different projects. I'd say hundreds of projects, uh, helping them launch data products from inception to prototype to it's no longer running on their machine and it's running on the cloud somewhere and it's useful for someone and, and being validated and evaluated. And so that was a lot of fun. And then I joined Shelf Engine because it is this AI for good product, which is really uniquely tied to um, a mission, which I think is really valuable. All of our profits at Shelf Engine are 100% driven to drive down food waste. And there was a really interesting article yesterday in the Washington Post about food waste um, and how one third of, of, uh, one third of food in America is wasted and how changing that would have a dramatic impact on climate and of course also on you know, the ability for people to eat. So I think that's uh, really been a push for me to make the best of my talents and skills in these areas. Uh, no, that's that's awesome. Um, uh, uh, a topic that we try to get into uh, amongst a variety of topics during these sessions is um, uh, making tangible impact, both sort of uh, pragmatically within a business, um, you know, uh, using data to, to make decisions, to get results, um, derive ROI, but also uh, uh, any larger impact that can be that can be made by uh, data and technology and, and you know, who, who are the folks pursuing that and, and what are the different ways? I think um, I want to go back into some of the larger data technology industry stuff, but just to sort of kick it off, um, could you tell me a little bit of a story uh, about uh, if I bought, uh, let's say, some mushrooms, uh, what is all the, the data and analysis that's going on behind the scenes before I make that purchase? Yeah, there's a really, we're at a really unique place. So I think when most people think about Shelf Engine, they think about, oh, you're running some forecasting models. And uh, when I train students, you could easily pick up canned forecasting models and packages and get them to work. And you would get some sort of output and forecast. And so that would be just part of it. And we do have, of course, a core set of forecasting models that makes sense. We also have really unique challenges that are unique to the grocery world that are really fun, like about mushrooms. Um, for example, especially when we think about food waste, if you are going, if you are a home chef and you are going to make some amazing uh, mushroom, organic mushroom, delicious, you know, wild mushroom ragu for your pasta, you know, and that that sounds really good uh, to me too. It actually takes many different kinds of mushrooms, and that means you're probably going to go to some special grocery store that you know will carry all of these things, and you're going to walk into this beautiful produce aisle and see 12 to 20 different kinds of mushrooms, pick your best selection, and go home and make your your pasta. And that sounds great, but in order to keep those shelves stocked with the 20 to 12 different kinds of mushrooms that you have to have, that means we have to keep them stocked all the time. And that level of freshness requires this constant replenishment or something that looks like constant replenishment so that you're happy, you're happy with your pasta, the stores are happy, 
But also now we have to think about, well, how much of that actually gets used daily and how much of that gets thrown away? Most of those mushrooms aren't going to get eaten. They're not going to go home to home chefs. They're just going to sit there and then get tossed into the trash, right? And that creates a huge food waste problem. This tension between people wanting to go to beautiful grocery stores that have beautiful rainbow arrays of food and at the same time us wanting to help the climate and not waste food and not overtax our farmers or our producers of food with this entire struggle in this food chain supply system. So I think what we're doing in Shelf is dealing with a lot of these interesting challenges of what happens when we don't want to stock everything to the same amount. We want to think about careful rotations of stock or maybe we want to think about uncertainty about whether something is actually going to get purchased, whether it's whether it makes sense and then whether it's going to show up in our data as an actual purchase. Um, for example, organic organic foods constantly go through self-checkout and when people buy organic and they go through self-checkout, they check them out as regular re regular produce. I've done this too, everyone has done it. Um, you're in a hurry at the end of the day and you're, you're rushing to buy your groceries and you just say, oh, well that looks, that looks like a, an apple. So I guess I'll pick that one. That one seems fine. I'm paying about the same price, right? Mm -hmm. And you go home with it, that turns out to like mess up. That messes up an entire system that we have uh, where we have a perfect forecaster that is now ordering regular, regular kinds of apples instead of organic apples. And so that ends up being a really interesting, you know, another tricky situation that we have to deal with. Just lots of really, there are just many, many really tricky situations in the grocery world that we have to, that we have to manage in order to, and we have to move from this complex system of forecasting models to managing these unique challenges and edge cases that we face. Yeah, that's great. And that's something I really wanted to get in, uh, into with you uh, today, because I think um, in, in your industry, as well as uh, many others, there's sort of a, a baseline of investment and energy put into, um, I believe you said it's around 80%, right, of the core foundation of, of what you're forecasting, what you're processing, what's being analyzed. Um, and uh, a lot of your hustle and, and great minds and analysis are going into um, sort of the repetitive, ongoing, uh, easy stuff. Um, but uh, that maybe the uh, competitive advantage is in, is in the details and in, in, in the edge cases. Um, you've got an incredibly uh, complicated and somewhat uncontrollable uh, set of inputs, um, different uh, grocery chains, uh, human error, manual input. Um, what are some of the edge cases that uh, you find the most interesting and um, how do you think uh, uh, sort of analysis and technology can kind of curb those moving forward? Oh, that was a really interesting question. Um, so every every uh, every new challenge is really interesting, and usually those come from human behavior and uncertainty around human behavior. So when people go and buy a buffet, a salad at the buffet, they walk into the salad, and that salad probably comes originally. It came as a giant box of spinach, right? And a giant box of spinach got divided up into six different kinds of salad. And so when a, a customer goes in and they say, oh, I'd like some of that salad, for one, we know that they're buying it by a weight. So they're getting, you know, uh, three pounds of salad or something like that. That would actually be a really big salad, so probably not that big. But they're buying some sort of salad and they probably walked into the behind the counter and we don't even have an accurate reading of how many, how many handfuls of spinach have gone into their salad given the amount of weight they purchased because they probably stood there and said, oh, could I have a little bit extra of that one? Or could I have a little extra of this? And we have no observability into that. We have no way of tracking that in our data. We have to then make guesses and really work hard to quantify that uncertainty and derive as much power as we can from the various data inputs that we have about what kind of customers go there. What neighborhood are they in? Are we talking about LA? Or are we talking about Iowa? Those are hugely different demographics that are shopping. And, um, and that's gonna drive our reasoning around what we think is being purchased in these, in these cases or assortments. No, that's, that, that's really cool. Uh, I'm curious, um, I don't wanna assume that uh, the furthest upstream you go is point of purchase. Uh, how far upstream do you go uh, you know, to, to, you know, maybe back all the way to the farm. How far upstream can you get in terms of uh, tracking, uh, tracking this produce? 
So right now what we do is we track it to say farms, distribution centers, uh, warehouses, or other, other people who are providing the retailers with those foods already. So we work within those contracts and within those bounds. So if Whole Foods likes to get something from a specific farm, we're gonna talk to them about that specific farm. We're pretty much every major retail already works with certain, certain places and we don't wanna necessarily disrupt that system. What we wanna do is create optimization around that system. And so we're thinking about how do we best optimize? How do we lay out a shelf um, or lay out an aisle in order to make this optimal? If we put broccoli and cauliflower there, we're not changing the farms that they get it from because people expect a certain level of quality or a certain kind of fruit or vegetable or something that they're looking at or a certain kind of meat. Um, we are we are changing like what rotation should that look like? What's the what's the size or, or amount of shelf that should be devoted to something like broccoli versus cauliflower? It turns out if you stock them equally, what do people buy? They buy the broccoli and then you're left with a ton of cauliflower. But if you stock the cauliflower a little bit earlier, you, they buy the cauliflower and then you catch up in the broccoli sale later, right? Because wow. people just default to broccoli. So there's all kinds of weird things that go on that are make this whole system less about just hitting a forecasting button. Yeah, I, that's that's hilarious. I, I definitely uh, default to broccoli. I never thought about it, but if I if I do anything, <laughs> it's it's probably that. Um, might be uh, might be a silly question. Might be a bit arbitrary, but. Uh, I'm very curious about the generation of, of a lot of the data that you that you use. Um, uh, obviously, self checkout uh, is expanding. Um, the uh, systems are not uh, wholly governed or owned by by the same technology or companies. Um, I, I am curious, sort of, what uh, challenges you face, uh, sort of, uh, aggregating or understanding those things as a whole versus individually. Uh, and then, as sort of an add on, is there a observable difference in the data quality? between uh, self-checkout and uh, the regular checkout? Hmm. We've never investigated the latter question of whether there's an observable difference in quality. And thankfully, we have an amazing team of engineers that deals with all of these ingestion processes. And there are a lot of them, as you can imagine. Um, all the things that go through, this is an old school industry and many startups actually face this challenge of dealing with an old school industry. How do you inject tech into this? And that is that is a struggle. Successful implementation, I think, is the hardest thing in AI. Um, and so we have what we have are we have we have questions about and we have a we have a field team devoted to helping us answer these questions initially. I think um, you know whether that's sustainable in the long term or how that works at scale. We're using new technologies and active learning and semi-supervised learning in order to get the best information possible from these different routes. But at the same time, you're absolutely right. Every single ingestion process for our data has a different level of quality associated with it, and we have many numerous uh, checks at different points for what's getting delivered, what's getting sold, what's in inventory, what's not in inventory, what's getting lost due to theft, what's getting lost just due to, you know, there's a pile of plums that sat together for too long and so that gets lost. But we don't actually see that in the data. Nobody's counting plums in the back, right? So I think we really have a bunch of different uh, processes around these things and, and that is um, one of the most challenging things. And also one of the reasons why we have an order automation service as part of this. We or automate the orders as opposed to being a software that people can use in the stores. It's really hard to train an industry that doesn't rely on this kind of thing or that has so many processes already to convert to a new software. So what we did as a business model it was we just took that part out of the equation and we said we will order it for you we will do all yeah. the forecasting and all the ordering for you we'll take over that entire pipeline for you as a supply chain service and then you don't have to do any of that you don't have to retrain you don't have to think about anything we just manage it all for you yeah that's fascinating i i might be i might be wrong about this i'm curious if you've come across uh, a somewhat similar business model in um in sort of managed healthcare, uh, people coming in with algorithms and technology, uh, saying we will uh, take responsibility for you know managing this patient through the process uh, to to reach the optimal outcome, uh, and we'll we'll be paid off of the you know the, the net uh, that sort of happens in the billing there. Um, is this a model that you see uh, as similar? You know, I don't want to assume that, that that's correct, uh, but but in general, something that can be applied to uh, sort of uh, more industries and. and What's sort of the challenge and benefit of it? 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's an interesting question. So I think that what we're seeing in AI and business is that there are many ideas by which we can use data now and many sources of data that often have messy challenges. Uh, but those things can be used and, and leveraged in ways to really help people, such as this managed healthcare idea and similar for our environmental social cause of reducing waste, right? And so we've got really interesting sets of ideas, but really tricky pathways around adoption and implementation of those ideas. And so we're seeing like interesting, uh, interesting levels of new companies coming in to help support this, this network and this need. We have the companies that are like Shelf Engine and like these managed healthcare systems who are building the, the bridges to AI from these industries. And then we have, because the ideas are there, but successful implementation is hard, we have a bunch of other companies that are sort of servicing the AI to help them develop these things faster. So they're helping with machine learning monitoring, they're helping with cloud services, they're helping with all sorts of data engineering and the engineering infrastructure challenges, which there are numerous challenges. And so there is just a plethora of new companies that are developing that are that are really taking off and, and competing against each other to develop the best product to support these ideas as they arise. So it's really fascinating, just tons of new ideas across different sectors in HR, healthcare, um, sales, um, you know, in our food service industry, in manufacturing, and we're going to see these continue to emerge, uh, especially as new generations are all being trained in computer science or some level of programming. We're going to see just this increase, massive increase over the next five to 10 years of companies that are able to do these and bring these new AI technologies into their system. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily like losing jobs. I don't want to frame it in that way. It's really that we are, I think we're, we're connecting the dots to improve people's lives and to have people spend less time on, at least for shelf, they're spending less time counting plums, right? And they're spending more time doing the important things like, like ha having the customer facing side to help their, their customer or similarly in healthcare, you're having more time, less time with doctors diagnosing simple things and more time with doctors giving a, a appropriate bedside manner to, and, and care to their patient. So I think there's really important ways that AI can help us in society and help us build a better society. And we're just seeing this, this amazing growth of these opportunities. Yeah, that that's that's great. It's really uh, it, it's really fascinating to see where it's going, and it's been a, a somewhat consistent theme in these conversations. We we recently spoke with uh, the CEO of uh, uh, Hive Dynamics. Um, they're a, sort of a sensor robotics company. Um, Cecilia Harvey is the, the CEO there, and we were talking about uh, some of the work that she does, um, uh, sort of promoting women in technology uh, and some of the causes there, uh, which I know that you are, are also very uh, passionate about. Um, and one of the things she was attributing to, uh, uh, you know, where a lot of growth and opportunity sort of takes place for women and for everybody is to expand the definition of what a tech job is um, in that coding and math, STEM, we don't all have to be uh, uh, total geniuses to, to take part in this because, um, you know, analytical thinking, uh, uh, common sense, context, th there's a lot of opportunities for for more, uh, uh, I don't know, regular people. I, I'm not good at math, so people like me to to come in and, and try to try to join this. Um, it, it seems like uh, you might feel the same. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's a really interesting nexus of talent that's needed in the AI and tech industry, and I think it's easy for people to think, oh, I need to learn statistics, or I need to learn machine learning, or I need to learn to code. Um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, the 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 side it takes to actually implement and actually answer business questions is the really hard part to train. It requires uh, specialty knowledge, domain expertise in a way, and I'm talking about domain expertise not in terms of textbooks, but in terms of real life. You know, I have to think carefully, just like the broccoli cauliflower example. I have to think carefully about how do I shop at the grocery store, and how does someone else shop at the grocery store, and what. What really makes a difference there? And that is not necessarily coming from the perspective of a data scientist. That's coming from the perspective of being a mom or, you know, being a normal yeah. person who went through different dieting fads, right? So there's a lot of really like normal common human sense and business sense that goes into creating a product that really wins. Um, and having that conversation between the more sort of technical expertise and, and the regular communication 
that allows that business logic to be injected into the system and to proliferate through the system in the right ways, that that is really essential. And that takes a diversity of experiences in order to make that really win and sell to people. And I think that's like, when we think about the business value of having diversity in tech or having women in tech, the business value is actually being able to speak to all of those people and give a pro make a product that appeals to everyone. So I think if we don't have those perspectives in the tech industry, we're going to lose out on entire markets. A absolutely. The, um, the, the extent to which uh, we inform um, the, these, these tools and analyses that we think are sort of uh, running our lives is, is a lot deeper than, than people think. Um, three or four years ago, uh, we started doing a lot of data quality projects, which are really fun. Companies love to, to engage in uh, manual, intensive data quality projects. But uh, in, in some cases, that's the only way to do it. Um, and the conversation then was a lot harder than it is to have now because I think people are having more experience with it. But what we were trying to sort of pose and, and, and explain to people is uh, you're, you're taking metadata somewhat seriously and you're considering it purely from a physical standpoint or a logical standpoint. Um, but you don't put any attention to the context of this. And since you're missing the context uh, and uh, the different ways it's defined and understood throughout the business, uh, every migration's failing, every report's wrong. and um, you, you and your team are informing your information far more than you think, uh, and you're making assumptions that are, that are sort of uh, causing problems. Um, so uh, with that as an aside, you, you do have an extensive background um, in academia. Uh, as I said, you're a, a published uh, author and you've given lots of, um, lots of speeches. How do you think uh, your background um, in that space informs uh, what you do now in uh, the private sector, um, well, the more private sector, I guess, uh, and what do you think academia can kind of provide uh, as, a, as a sort of throttle for, for industry? So many things. I actually think my experience in academia is fascinatingly similar to my experience as head of data science. Mm. Um, I am still, I'll, I'll just give you a couple of things that I've thought about recently that I still do. Please. I still think about complex social behavior. So my problem space really hasn't changed. Even though I'm no longer thinking about war and peace, I am thinking about uh, different complex systems of behavior that still result in some outcome. It has a lot of uncertainty built into it. It has a lot of complex modeling that can improve around the edges. And I think that to me is the science part of what, why I like doing what I'm doing. I think as having trained so many different data scientists, data engineers with so many different backgrounds, backgrounds from humanities, comparative literature, backgrounds in social sciences, psychology, economics, and, and of course, like the STEM subjects as well, astronomy and physics and other things like that. So the more typical things that you see in, in tech, there are so many interesting perspectives and techniques that are shared across these, as well as some niche uh, talents from different individuals who come from different backgrounds that really help make the product space better for almost any product that we can imagine in tech. And I think that's really fascinating. So really, whatever you're getting your education in, all of it is valuable. Um, as long as you become you know, the expert in that, you will be useful. Um, and then when I think about how I run the team, a lot of my leadership thinking actually comes from being a former professor. So I think really carefully about matching people's personal and professional goals, which is exactly what I did as a professor. I think really carefully about what is the edge of their comfort zone so I keep them learning. And I think in general, people like to learn. They're motivated when they feel like they're growing. And I think that's a maybe a natural human instinct or something like that. So I try to match people's personal and professional goals keep them at the edge of what they're doing. I want to bank on their skills and their expertise that they have, but I also want to see where they're comfortable and where they fit so that they start to grow and push themselves a little further. And that I think allows us to hire the best team, but then also to grow that best team to be even better. And I, I think that's really, you know, something that's valuable in having the experience as a professor or having experiences in coaching and mentoring and helping to develop people and develop talent and see them through. One of my most proudest things that I that I get to be a part of is when I see my students go off and do amazing things. And now in the tech industry, I see people promoted and doing amazing things. And that makes me equally excited. I'm like, you found yourself, you found your way forward, you're contributing to the world. That's amazing. And so I'm, I'm always really excited to see that. So I think it's really a question of like, 
domain expertise, subject matter expertise that you're gaining in, skills that you're getting, no matter what it is, as we mentioned, doesn't have to be these technical math. You know, you don't have to be solving integrals in order to make this work for you. But you need something that you have developed, some core set that you've developed that you can then contribute and you can find your place on a team. So that's part of it. And the other part is this mentoring, coaching, and helping these individuals grow into, into amazing people. Yeah. Uh, and um, I hope it's not too forward, but uh, according to your LinkedIn profile, uh, Shelf Engine is hiring. So anyone who's watching this, uh, if that's not a compelling pitch, uh, I don't know what would be. Um, uh, and, and sort of to that end, another topic that we have is uh, we like to kind of come back around to the, the evolving roles in, in data um, as sort of business and IT are coming closer and closer together. Uh, titles are getting thrown out there. Um, the makeup of a, of a team is sort of changing. The way projects are managed are from a more data perspective than maybe a software development perspective. How do you see sort of the, the makeup of, of uh, teams as a whole and then the roles within them? Uh, how has that changed over the last couple of years? And you know, where do you think it might go uh, in the next few? Oh, that's really interesting. So in the last, if we think about 2013, I was lecturing to students in 2013 at Harvard. And I remember showing them this slide. And the slide was, uh, the sexiest job of the 21st century is the data scientist. And I thought, like, what does that mean? And you know what's funny is we can still ask that same question. What does that mean, right? And so we see tons of jobs for data science. But when it, when it comes down to it, the data scientists that I have coming in the hiring pool look completely different from each other. They come in at all different levels. Uh, they come in with all different skill sets. And I think we're being forced to reconcile you know, this challenging hiring process with uh, the diversity of talent that's coming in as a data scientist or as a data engineer. Even that is, is very challenging or software engineer. Um, are you a database engineer? Are you... Are you, you know, SRE? Are you, there's like, all, are you a cloud engineer? There's so many different types of things and types of skill sets. And the truth is when we're forming teams, we actually have needs for very different things, depending on what stage we are in product development, also depending on the kind of product that we're launching, and also dependent on the skills that we've managed to grow within our team or that we have available with our team. So I'm, I'm thinking very carefully about what's the makeup of my team and how am I going to fill this spot for this particular need and then how do I get a job out out there that reads data scientists that actually fills that very particular need? That is truly a challenge. And I think everybody's facing that challenge. That's not unusual right now or in the past few years. So we've seen um, the change in the 2013 role of data scientists to now we have data engineers and data scientists and senior data scientists and research scientists and applied scientists. So that's like five different roles for the data scientists. But even that's not really well defined. So now we also have supply chain data scientists, pricing, optimization data scientists. You know, there's just so many other extra things. And I think we're going to continue to see that narrowed down into the entire scope of what AI means, what a machine learning ecosystem means. All of that is going to have to filter down in some way to make this clearer for everyone. Most likely, that's not going to come necessarily from startups, but that's going to come from uh, these larger top companies that are hiring more broadly that can really set the definitions. Um, and then as those succeed, I think most likely we're going to see that proliferate down to other companies as well that adopt those. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And um, just to sort of take advantage of your uh, uh, academic uh, experience again, um, from, from what you saw when, when you took part in the uh, academic world uh, and, and sort of what you see now, uh, are the pipelines there? Uh, are are uh, the the sort of uh, uh, curriculum designs uh, appropriate for what we need uh, out here in the market, or is that still a challenge? I think that's a challenge. Um, I think that when we see, you know, when I look at education right now, education lags behind industry needs right now. Um, this is becoming a globally competitive marketplace for talent. And it's it's fascinating. It's a fascinating globally competitive marketplace for talent. And we are not isolated. You know, there's no there's no real ocean dividing us in this in this world of the internet, right? So what we have instead are a huge pool, if we look at the what the talent pyramid looks like, there's a huge pool of talent of junior talent. 
And then this pyramid, as you go up, yeah, there's many fewer people at sort of the top in terms of the experiences that they need to have or uh, the kinds of questions they can manage, the kinds of end-to-end -end projects they can manage, the kinds of business relationships they can manage and, and take in and absorb. All of those things become sort of skills you need toward the top that are not widely available or not available through Coursera and Data Camp and everything else that exists out there to fill the void between education and industry right now, which is exactly why those things exist and why those those camps are doing well is because, yeah, there is a there is a deficit right now. We have curriculum that's designed for maybe 10 years ago, and the truth is the industry has moved so fast in the past 10 years. People are looking for outside sources in order to get that education to make themselves useful and viable and competitive in this market. I think that's really challenging and we're going to, right now, I think that, that edu the education system is challenged in this way and they're trying to catch up. There are many more data science camps available or many more coding things that are that are integrated even at elementary school levels. You can now have elementary school coding classes uh, where you get your own robot or do things like that. And I think that's fascinating and we're moving in the right direction, but the industry is moving a lot faster. Yeah, no, no, totally agree. Um... Uh, it's 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 crazy to see uh, uh, week to week, year to year. Um, you know, the talk about the gap between um, you know, potentially uh, education and um, business and what's actually happening in the market. And then I think there's another gap uh, on the other side, uh, which uh, has more to do with sort of hype cycles uh, and and buzzwords and and unrealistic expectations about what this all can do. Um, how do you sort of uh, uh, approach being in a uh, startup environment where you're doing AI and machine learning while also uh, maintaining a realistic uh, expectation and definition of what that actually means and what it takes to, to, to do that? Because um, obviously I, I think uh, it's marketed more than it's done, uh, and I'm not sure that there's a, uh, a common socialized understanding of what it is we're actually talking about when we talk about practical day-to-day -day applications of these things. Yeah, I think what's funny is that, um, you know, I think there are a lot of buzzwords and everybody wants to work on the latest neural net technology and deep learning and everybody wants to use, you know, adversarial networks for something or, or do the, the latest and greatest thing. And the truth is maybe the data or infrastructure aren't there to support that. The business needs, it doesn't make sense to do that or simply like, there's a different approach that is necessary. Maybe there's a more statistical approach that's necessary. Maybe there's just a business logic, simple computation that's necessary. You know, like, let's be real here. We don't need a neural net for everything. Um, and the truth is like, if we think about, if we think about things that have, have taken advantage of deep learning and neural net technology, these are really complex things that we've made better. So when I think about, how do I get from place to place on my phone? It used to be the case that I'd have to open up a map. I'd have to think about like, what neighborhood am I in? Do I happen to know what restaurants are here or something like that? Or if not, I'm gonna look at the main street because the main street probably has the strip of, of, of restaurants for me, right? But now you just plug it into your phone. And I think when we think about what it took to get there, it took maps and routes and traffic and weather and coordination among other drivers and information about every location, that actually is a complex system that can make us make our decisions better, right? That's an interesting complex system that takes many different inputs. And yes, that feasibly, when we think about designing a product, that product can make life better. Similarly at Shelf, we have similar things where, yeah, school schedules, weather, those things are going to affect whether people go to the grocery store or not, right? If I know my kids are going to be home for seven days, I'm going to buy a lot of food and you're going to see an increase in the sale of snacks. But, yeah. you know, otherwise it doesn't matter for a lot of other things. There are certain aspects of this forecasting system that don't require that level of technical detail. So I think we need to be real in the tech industry and be legitimate when we sell our product in terms of understanding and be real when we talk to investors as well about this actually doesn't require a neural net. And, and the reason for that is because, yeah, we're a mature enough product to know that we don't have to hit the next fancy button to get it to work well, that our actual question, our actual challenges go back to these other questions. And I think that as we start to have those real conversations, 
And as investors start to notice that those are the real conversations and that those are the winning products, I think that's really going to change that dimension. And it's going to help us hire the right people and make the right appeals in our data science ads because it's true. Shelf Engine also has a data science ad, job ad that lists all the latest and greatest fancy things. But the truth is like, yeah. we also look at a lot of other people who are very talented at answering very precise questions and moving for, through ambiguity, through the ambiguous business questions that we have to actually implement a solution quickly. And that is not about launching the latest deep learning, you know, fancy hyperparameter tuned uh, model. Uh, so in regards to the uh, uh, investor side, um, uh, I think in startups and in tech, um, uh, profit and outcomes haven't always been the, the primary um, uh, destinations of, uh, of a lot of um, what has been uh, funded. But I think we're on, uh, I think maybe the other side or getting to the other side where uh, there is a more practical view of, um, of what we should invest in and, and what we want. Uh, and yielding, um, you know, some sort of outcome. Uh, Shelf Engine uh, seems to be designed around a very outcome-oriented promise, um, which means, uh, you know, what you do has to be done and has to be uh, explainable and, um, and and compelling. Uh, and certainly the way you talk about it, it, it very much is. Um, the last question I want to ask is, I know that you have spoken about data ethics in regards to business learning from academia. Um, I'm interested in data ethics in general as, as a wider concept. Um, the space you're in, uh, the, the way you talk about it, there's certainly a moral purpose. Um, there is a, a lot of information, probably some privacy uh, stuff that you have to take care of. Um, and, and also there's a, there's a, a very good objective uh, with, with all the technology and, and work that's being done. How do you sort of look at data ethics as it applies to, to what you do at Shelf Engine and then also uh, as an evolving concept um, sort of worldwide? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think there's a big movement, uh, especially given uh, the recent news with Google and uh, some of the things going on there in terms of what is responsible AI, what is ethical AI, what is explainable machine learning. I think there are companies that are devoted to this question and it's, it's becoming a really interesting space. Um, it's clear that AI has tons of impact on people. And so, yes, it is tied to Shelf Engine's mission to have a responsible AI. Um, you know, we want to do something that is good for the climate and good for society. And I think that's a that's an important component of it. Are you working for something that you think is contributing in a certain way to to uh, to the to the greater good? But that's only one component. Obviously, not every every company is going to be able to do this. We all have different missions, and that's perfectly fine. Um, there are two other important aspects to thinking about data ethics and responsible um, AI. And one of those is um, around this question of data privacy, which you mentioned, and this understanding of, you know, how long do we really need to keep our data? Do we really need to keep individual data? Are we using it? Are we using it responsibly? I think that those are those are real questions because we live in a society where data gets hacked where uh, companies, you know, go under, where, um, you know, th there are tricky situations for individuals who have access to different data. And I can't imagine what it would be like if, um, if, if uh, you know, all of the data that were available about me were truly publicly available. You know, everybody has different like skeletons in their closet or just different aspects of their lives that they don't want to be part of the public space. Do you want other people to be basing products off of those off of those connections? It's not clear that you really want that. That's really going to be advantageous to uh, every individual. So I think we have to make careful choices in our data storage, in our machine learning models, in order to understand like what is it that we're doing with this, and what are the potential adverse effects that we're going to have on individuals. That's one element. The other element I think is that, and I, I I try to explain this as simply as possible to people who have a statistics background. So you'll have to tell me if you think that this is clear or not. But every model, imagine you fit a line to a bunch of points. In order to fit that line, you're making trade-offs against every point. Some of those are gonna be above, some of those are gonna be below. And machine learning is exactly the same way. You are making trade-offs in every model, statistically speaking, against different points. Some cases are gonna come out winners, some cases are gonna come out losers. 
And what does that mean for a place like Shelf Engine or a place that's working on responsible AI or, or something like that? It means that you really need to be careful about who the losers are because what machine learning is doing is it's taking advantage of patterns and that means people will be systematically in that losing category. So what does that long tail look like? You know, what, what is that, who are those people who are not being served appropriately? And there's a business compelling reason for this and an ethical reason for this. The ethical reason is you wanna make sure that those people are not left out systematically in some way, that they're not disadvantaged by your product. The business reason is because by servicing an entire extra group of people, of course, you're making your product more valuable to those people. And therefore, you're able to increase profit or sales or anything else along those individuals as well. And so improving along the margins has a business ethic, a business dimension and an ethical dimension. And if we think about things in that way, I think we can really get on board with the idea that ethical AI here is not a bad thing. It's a necessary thing for product growth and it's a necessary thing to differentiate yourself among others who are not actually achieving that goal. Yeah, no, that's fascinating from, from so many, uh, so many levels. Um, and, and there is such a, a clear a positive application um, and, and a fairly pragmatic one when you speak of it in the way that, that you have. I think also uh, you mentioned companies potentially going under, right? That there's this sort of weird fiduciary responsibility uh, around data that I don't think has been uh, wholly accepted. Uh, for instance, if we applied accounting principles to, to, to data, it would be, uh, it would be a, a bit messy and, and confusing, right? I don't think anyone... Uh, is putting that on the balance sheet yet in any specific way. Um, but, you know, 80% of assets in the Fortune 500, I think, are digital at this point. You know, don't quote me, but we're, we're, we're valuing uh, our, our products and work uh, in, in uh, less physically tangible ways than, than maybe we used to. And um, I think there's some uh, ethical concerns around that as well, probably. Yeah, definitely. Oh, we're going to have, I mean, <laughs> I don't know when this is going to come, uh, but I'm I'm sure that, let's say a decade from now, um, policy and legislation around data is going to look very different, right? We've already seen like new developments with GDPR. Um, maybe I think that was either 2018 or 2019, um, probably 2018, I think. Uh, and that was, you know, that really, I think, uh, has had serious financial impacts for places like Google and Facebook. And I think we're going to probably see more of those kinds of things or more potentially more coordination, at least at federal levels, not necessarily at global levels, but there is this push for understanding, you know, where, what should we be auditing in certain ways? Should there be more regulation in certain ways? And what does that mean? And I think that companies, if they want to stay out of that, which I think most companies probably do want to stay out of that, um, we're going to need to be take initiative and and become more responsible and uh, understand sort of the the, the Spider-Man world of with great power could becomes a great responsibility. You need to be responsible with what you're doing because you have real impact on people's lives.